What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You know, when I was a kid, I used to play this game called Telephone. Have you ever played the game Telephone? I'll describe it a little bit for you. So, in Telephone, you have a group of people. It could be kids, adults, you name it. They stand in line. And in one end, somebody says a phrase or whatever it is. And what the goal is, is you have to say it from one person to the next all the way down the row until it gets to the end. Now, what you want at the end is you want the same phrase to be said from the beginning, right? And then at the end, it should be the same phrase. But nine times out of 10, maybe 100% of the time, it's never the same, right? And if you're like my friends, most of my friends do it on purpose, and they completely mess it up every single time, and we get to the end, and we're like, no, this is not how the game's supposed to go. You are supposed to get from here to there and figure out the exact same thing. It's one of the oldest games that has been played of all time, and it's a form of communication. It's a form of focus, right? So we go from one end, we're supposed to focus on what's going on, we're supposed to get to the end, we communicate with one another, we make it all the way to the end, there's no paper, there's nothing. And it always seems that something happens, right? So, when we're talking about doctrine, it's very important to understand that at the beginning, the people who were proclaiming the gospel were preaching the word of God, right? They were sharing it with one another. As they were preaching, they were telling it to different people. They were trying to share. They were going into their homes, and they were trying to teach their children exactly what the gospel is. And then the goal was that the next generation behind them were supposed to take that exact same gospel and preach it to the next generation, right? And so on and so forth and all the way down the line until here we are today, 2,000 years later, and we're still trying to preach the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, along the way, sometimes when we're preaching the gospel, we might get it wrong. And some people might get it skewed, which ends up being denominational, you know, conflicts between different churches. You might have different households thinking different religions, different beliefs, and on and on and on and on and on. So our goal as Christians in doctrine is to maintain what the gospel says and to preach it to the world. Are you with me? So today, last week we worked on focus. We were supposed to focus on the goal at hand. The goal at hand was to preach the gospel and to preach it in a way that is what the gospel says it is. The second thing that we need to remember in the gospel is as we preach the gospel, we must maintain the gospel. We must understand that the gospel says what it says, and that's that, right? And so today we're going to look at a second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. And we're going to look at the the similarities between the two. We're going to look at whether or not he's still preaching the same gospel that he preached a while back. We're going to see how it relates today. So Paul is writing from prison once again. Why is he in prison? He's preaching the gospel, right? People in Rome did not like the gospel. People in America sometimes don't like the gospel, do they? Paul, is he doesn't care. He's in prison. He's still writing to all of his friends. He's writing to his different missionaries on different journeys. He's going to write to Timothy this time, but this time in his second letter, he knows absolutely for a fact that his time on earth is not going to be very much longer. He is going to die from persecution from King Nero in Rome at the time. And he is going to tell, Paul Paul is going to tell Timothy that here's what I want you to do, that no matter what 
happens to me, I want you to hold on to the beliefs that I taught you so that you could teach it to the next generation and so on. Paul's going to tell him, I want you to maintain all of this faith that you have. And he's going to use some really amazing words in this letter to tell Timothy, I want you to hold on. I want you to maintain this gospel. I don't want you to listen to all of these different people that are telling you all of these different things. I want you to take a look at what this scripture says, what you've been taught and preached over years and years and years, and I want you to share that with the next group of church people. Are you with me? It's amazing. So let's start. We're going to be 2 Timothy. We're going to start right out of the gate. We're going to be in chapter 1. In verse 1. So Paul is writing another letter to Timothy. Here's what he says in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. The promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. He already talked about salvation in the very first sentence. How about that, right? It's good preaching. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. We saw that last week, right? Grace, mercy, peace. Verse 3. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did. With a clear conscience, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. So Paul is talking to Timothy about how Timothy got his faith and how Paul sees it lived out in Timothy's daily life. He says, I thank God in verse 3, whom I serve as my ancestors did, With a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. How important is prayer? It is very, very important. Prayer. We talked, I talked to somebody outside that said you gotta push, right? Pray until something happens. Pray until something happens, right? God loves to listen to his children, no matter what it is. Happy, sad, angry, mean, all the emotions. God gives us all those wonderful emotions, right? to be able to pray and seek out who it is and to just continue to pray to, pray to him. Verse four, he says, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith. When you look up at a believer, when you see them, do you, can you tell when they're doing something real, when their life is really living out with Christ and whether it's fake? Can you tell a fake person from a real person, I guess is the way that I should put it where somebody's just trying to be somebody they're not. We see a lot of that today, don't we? Social media skews our minds in a way that is so unbelievable to me. We live in this alternate reality all of the time, and then we get back to reality, and we try to figure out, and we meet the same person, and we're like, hey, that's not you. I saw you over here on social media doing all of this stuff, but no, here you are doing all of this stuff. That doesn't make sense. Paul is saying, I remember your sincere faith, sincerity, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice. So here he's talking about genealogy. And then he says, I'm persuaded it now lives in you also. You see, he grew up in a multi-religious family. He had different religions, different beliefs going into him. And so when his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice were preaching the gospel to him, he's saying, I noticed the generational beliefs being handed down to you. I saw it. I see it from your grandmother. I see it in your mother. And now I see it in you. Do you see the telephone line there? You see the telephone line? Remember the game telephone? That wasn't too long ago. I talked about that, right? We're all right. It started here with the grandmother. We don't know the genealogy before the grandmother because he doesn't talk about it. It went on and grandmother taught it to mother, right? 
Mother then learned from grandmother, carried on to mother. Mother went on to Timothy. Timothy took this and he said, I want to share this with the church. Paul came behind him and said, let me mentor you. Let me share what I know with you so that you could be bold and stronger. Relationships are important, but family is importanter. Are you with me? Family is importanter. It's more important. What you grow up with is what you do. It's who you are. If you live in a family that is in conflict all the time, that doesn't maybe believe in Jesus, that doesn't go to church, it doesn't mean that you won't ever not believe in Jesus Christ. You just, it takes longer. And if you could teach your children from a young age who Jesus Christ is and continue to pour into them, they can take that and bring it to their kids. And then they can bring that and bring it into their kids. Do you know why we have holes in the pews? Because somewhere along the line, the telephone chain got broken. And it started here with somebody in your family who might have believed way back or not so far back. And then it went and then it went and then it went and somebody said, I don't believe in that stuff anymore. And then it broke. And then the next generation said, well, I never learned about Jesus here. But then somebody, it it just changed. You see, are you tracking with me? Paul constantly balances all of these exhortations about right doctrine with reminders that we are only capable of advancing the gospel by the grace of God and the grace of God alone. We can't fully rely on the telephone chain, although it's important. We have to rely on the grace of God to continue to advance the gospel. In fact, this truth forms the basis of much of his correction in these letters, reminding believers that their works cannot earn them into salvation and that loyalty to the truth of the gospel requires rebuking any additions or modifications to its basic truth. The gospel is what it says it is. The gospel does what it says it does. It is living, it is breathing, it is active. And Paul says, Timothy, this is what you need to remember. Don't look at all the works that we've done, although that's great, right? Look at the gospel. Let's look at verse 6. So he says, here's your genealogy. You've been brought up in the faith. I see your boldness. I see your your faith in Christ. Verse 6, he says, For this reason I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but it gives us power. Remember that. The spirit gives us power. Love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. That's good stuff. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Through the gospel. He continues to point everything back. He's using our focus. He's saying, maintain this gospel, this preaching, this stuff that I've been teaching you. There's an awesome word that I I, I wanted to look up. Go back with me up to verse six, where it says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame. This Greek word is a big word, and it's really cool. It's it's anazopyrio. Anazopyrio. 
And it means just that. I tried to look to see to make sure that we had the right translation there. It literally means, I, Paul said, I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God. He says, I want you to accept it. I want you to fan it into flames. And he says, it's always inside of us. So we, we just read through Acts a little bit ago, and Acts teaches us that when we accept Jesus, we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, right? We receive it inside of us, which means when we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, we have that power inside of us forever. It is always in you. It will always be in you, whether you walk away from God or not. It is always inside of you. This is why fan the flames is so important. He says we have to maintain this. But sometimes, I don't know if you're a fire entrepreneur or connoisseur, fires don't always stay as hot as you want them to be, right? I love fires. I love making fires. I love building fires. I love the way they look. I love the way they smell. I told my wife the other day, if we could find a candle that had firewood smoke smell, I would, I would scent that baby all day long, and our whole house would smell like smoke. <laughs> I love fires. I just love everything about them. And fires are really cool. So like when you, you, you build it, you build it with a, a small ball a really small ball of some sort of paper or kindling, something really tiny to get that thing going. And then you build on top of it, and you build like smaller sticks, right? And then you put that on top of that, and then you get a little bigger sticks, and you put that on top of that. And then what you do, see, here, here's a pro tip for you. Don't put the big logs on until you light the fire. Are you with me? Are you with me? Here's why. Because it loses oxygen. It loses oxygen. When you put all that stuff on there, it doesn't know how to breathe. And so when you light the fire, it starts with this little small ember, this little small moment where this thing just lights in the middle. It catches on to the other small sticks around it. Then it gets the bigger sticks on top of that. Now, before you get to the bigger sticks, throw the big logs on or you'll burn your hand. All right, and then the big logs come on. Once the big logs come on, that sucker is flaming. It is hot. Do you remember the moment in time when you had such a fiery Holy Spirit in your life that you couldn't contain it? Do you remember that moment in your faith where you just went out and told everybody, you preached the good news of Jesus Christ to everybody, when you got baptized for the first time and you walked out of that tank and you went down the street and you said, I'm a Christian. You remember that moment? And the fire's just so high. But sometimes the fire doesn't stay that way, does it? You know, one of my second favorite moments in a fire is the embers at the end. So when you look at the fire, it doesn't look hot when it's just the embers. But they're hot. Don't touch them, okay? Grab a stick. Here's another pro tip for you. When your fire is almost out, grab a stick. And you know what you do? You stir that fire up. And what happens? It gets hotter, and it gets hotter, and it gets hotter. And then you throw more sticks on, right? And then you throw the bigger sticks on, and the fire gets bigger. You see, you always have Holy Spirit embers inside of you. It never goes out. But do you know what you need sometimes? You need a stick to stir the embers. And when we do that, you're going to fan the flames. And Paul says to Timothy, he says, I want you to fan the flames in your life, and I want you to give everybody that power of the Holy Spirit. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I want you to maintain those flames. Maintain those flames. 
So in verse 9 and verse 10, we just talked about it. It talks about these different doctrines. It talks about the calling of believers to live holy lives. Here's, here's how you maintain the embers. He says, you, you, need, you need to call believers to live holy lives as opposed to living in sin. Don't be fake, right? Be the same person all the time. He talks about the sufficiency of grace. We're not perfect, right? We all fall short of the glory of God. That's in Romans. So remember that. He also says in verse 9, the eternal pre-existence and divinity of Christ. He has always been here. He always was here. He always will be here. Jesus has always been here. And the power of Christ's work in verse 10 on the cross to provide eternal salvation. He gives us the opportunity of eternal life forever. And while each of these truths are significant, there is a broader message that he's talking about here. The gospel is all about grace, and anything that distorts that truth is denying the gospel. T.D. Lee, in his commentary, he says, the availability of God's sovereign grace through Christ would brace the wavering resolve of Timothy. It's also important to Timothy to recall that God's saving purpose had been at work before the world was founded. The grace did not become a central thrust of God's work in the world only until after the cross. Grace has always been central. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. So Paul calls Timothy to fan these flames. And then we get into verse 11. He says, And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle as a teacher and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet, this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Verse 13, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. 14, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. He gives us some good theology there, some good doctrine to live by. Verse 12, it talks about being a herald. We sing that at Christmas time, right? Hark the angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Herald, we're proclaiming, right? Being a herald of the gospel. But he says, when you become a herald, you're going to encounter suffering. When you start saying, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And then you got to crescendo, right? Glory to the newborn king. When you start doing that, you're going to start get, getting suffering is what he's saying. Christians, we often read verses like 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. It talks all about suffering for the gospel and the forms of different religious persecution and all of this stuff that you, that you could go through, imprisonment, martyrdom, being stoned, being flogged, all of these things. But living a godly life might result in different forms of suffering. It might result in different ways of persecution. And so Paul comforts Timothy with two truths. Believing the gospel will cause suffering, but that it's not in vain. You see, we've got a job to do. This is what Paul's saying. We've got a job to do. It's our job responsibility to get this stuff to the world. And here's what we got to do. We got to start here in the telephone chain with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, with the cashier lady at Walmart. And you got to tell them, Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sin is reconciled. And you just got to keep at it. And you're going to get persecuted. You're going to suffer. There's going to be pain in your life. 
when you become a Christian, you don't lose all of that stuff. In fact, sometimes it's worse. But what Paul is saying is it's not in vain. Don't think that what you're doing, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, is in vain. He says it's not in vain. You are going to live in eternity with God in heaven. We've got to take as many people as possible to bring us, to bring them to that glory. And so when we're teaching all of this gospel, when we're looking at all of this stuff, there's two questions that we need to ask. One of the questions is, when we're preaching the gospel, is does it prioritize grace? Are you shoving it in them or are you giving it to them? Are you with me? Are you shoving it at them? Does it prioritize grace? Because people who don't know Christ, are, they don't know what we believe in, right? They're not going to walk and talk and all of this stuff like who, who we and what we do. They need grace. And the second thing is, does it acknowledge the reality of suffering? Are you preaching the gospel boldly? Are you doing it with courage? Are you doing it with strength? Are you doing it bravely? And so he closes out this little portion in chapter one by saying, I want you to guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. And so here's what Paul is saying. Guard it with everything. You're going to hear all these different belief systems. And here's what he's trying to say. He's trying to say, I'm not sure I understand. Siri, I'm not talking to you. She didn't understand what I was saying. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Man, I was getting to a good point, too. Golly, Satan's trying to destroy some good stuff. Paul is trying to tell Timothy, do you remember how you grew up? Do you remember what your family life was? Do you remember all of the different things that your grandmother and your mother taught you when you were a kid? He's saying, do you, do you remember all of these different things that they did for you, that they cared for you, that they brought you up, that they raised you up in Christ? And he's saying, I want you to take this stuff and I want you to focus on it and I want you to maintain it. I want you to hold on to it. In fact, he says, I want you to guard it. Guard the good deposit. Don't let people sway your opinion on who Jesus is. Don't let them change your idea about how church should be, be run, be operated, be done on a Sunday morning or during the week. We run church 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It doesn't end on Sunday. And so we want to tell everybody, guard the good deposit that you have had in your life. Protect the Holy Spirit that is inside of you. If the Spirit is low in your life right now, Paul is saying, I want you to fan the flames in your life so that the embers grow a little bigger so that you could be on fire for God. He knows it's going to happen. We're all sinners and so he knows it's going to happen. So he says, I want you to be a herald. I want you to send it out. I want you to tell people about Christ. And I don't want you to stop. And I want you to guard it and guard everything in your life that isn't that. That is that. Get rid of everything that isn't. <sighs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> this morning... If you want to talk about a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit this morning, let's have a conversation about that. If you want to get baptized this morning, I don't care what clothes we're wearing, let's just go get dunked, all right? Let's just go get baptized. There is no better time to do any of this stuff except for right now. Jesus Christ is, he was, and he will be 
our life forever. He will be in our lives forever. All we have to do is believe. The gift is free of charge, and that's it. So this morning, if you want to do that, please come up here this morning. Uh, Let me pray, and then we'll stand, and we'll sing a song of invitation. Heavenly Father, I just, I thank you for guarding our hearts, and I pray that you continue to guard our hearts from the evil that is happening in the world around us. Father, I pray for the people around us who have yet to, to start this guarding process of their hearts. And I pray, Father, that we can teach them, that we can continue to pour into them who you are and how to, how to believe in who you are and how to walk like you. And Father, I ask that you te- continue to teach us to be bold in our faith, that you continue to help us walk and fight the good fight that we need to be doing right now in this world. Father, this morning, I pray that you will protect our congregation, that you will protect all the Christians and loved ones around us. Father, I pray that you will bubble them and that you will hold them tight. I pray that you will give them grace and mercy and peace as they go about their days. Father, you know that life is hard. Father, you know that it's tough. And so, Father, I pray that we could be bold, that we can stand out, that we can eliminate some of the darkness in this world, Father, and shine your light throughout it all. We love you, Father. We thank you for your son who you sacrificed on the cross for our sins, for lowly sinners like us, so that we may have eternal life with you. It is in your most wonderful, powerful name that we pray all of these things. Amen.